All right, we are back here talking Sky Guys season two recap of the Clone Wars. First up, my guest today, the guy who joined me last week. I should talk about WandaVision. Nick Frietta is here. Nick, how are you? Doing well. Again, I'm ready to talk about season two. You know, we saw a lot of improvement and I, we're going to get into it, but I'm really excited to talk about it because I, I thought it was bound and least better than season one. Yeah, definitely a lot better than season one. Wouldn't you agree, Pete Contadori? Oh, so much better. So much better. Thanks for having me. It's always great to be on the on the show with you and Nick. Um, like we're going to talk about season two, I think, are, le- you know, a good league and a half better than season one. Um, I'm, ex- I'm excited. I'm excited. I am, too, because I have to admit, season two, I had heard, okay, it's getting better. We have all the bounty hunters. Here we go. It's getting more exciting. Then right off the bat, the premiere, the three-part, like, arc to open the season with Cad Bane, you're like, wow, they have things figured out more. There are some potholes along the way. We'll definitely get into those. But I think as a whole, Pete, you were right. I think it's a much more complete, better season than we saw in season one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, that first story arc, boom, starts off the season strong. Um, you know, a couple characters thrown in there that we'll talk about that I don't think were needed. But, um, yeah, no, it was it was a great story arc to throw, to, to throw us into season two. Um, feels like just yesterday we were talking about season one, but it was, it was a month away, right? Uh, so I think that it was less of a burden to watch it. Right. I think if it was like season one, again, we'd be sitting here going, Oh God, it took so long to get through it. But yeah, it was good. It was definitely, definitely much better. Yeah. Nick, one thing I noticed too, with this season was interesting was that season one, they sort of felt we have to shoehorn in every character, you know, from the film. So here's four episodes with Jar Jar. Here's seven with Padme. Here's a bunch with C3PO being randomly involved in the story. I feel like they had a better handle this season, Nick of like, okay, these are the ones we need. Like, we saw zero Jar Jar this season. He did not fit in the story. We saw very little of C-3PO this season. Padme had a much smaller role. I feel they had a better role idea of, like, okay, these are the ones who are working. Let's use them more. Yeah, the, the show this season just focuses really on Anakin, Obi-Wan, and um, Ahsoka, like, a lot. Like, those are your characters. And oddly enough, the I said the fourth main character this season was probably Mace Windu. He was in a decent amount, but... Um, really those three, those are the three stars of the show. And they really separated themselves from the three stars of the show. And I got to say though, the first thing I noticed when watching season two, again, for me, because I've seen it before, is that the animation is so much better in season two than it is in season one. Like the characters that make facial expressions that you can actually like, it's not just like one linear motion and like, they look less robotic and they really like the animation is so much better. I'm sure the budget was so much higher for the season than it was in season one. Yeah, I definitely thought it was a lot better. I've heard, Nick, am I wrong that season three, you get a actual like upgrade in the animation, like further from what we got? Yeah, I think the character designs are going to change. And not really a lot, very little bit. And then I think they believe they change again in season six. But you get a little, or maybe, maybe it's seven. Well, I know they change in seven. That's when they brought it back recent. But you're going to see like Ahsoka, for example. But, you know, she looks like, I think we mentioned this before, maybe she's like 13. I know we, I know that her actual age is out there, but she looks like she's like 12, 13 years old. And she'll start looking a little, I know actually, actually kind of weird because she'll look a little older, but she's not really any older if you think about it. It only takes place over a two or three year period, but she starts looking a little more mature and older and like, and just better, you know, especially you notice it with um, Anakin and Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan Kenobi felt really stiff to me in season one and re- and the movie, especially like just awful looking. And they really look, they're really starting to get the animation down. Yeah, indeed. And Pete, you and I got into this because of Mandalorian and all of the connections from Clone Wars. How surprised were you when we get to season two? We only get the Death Watch form. We get the Dark Saber in season two. I was completely shocked we got it this early. Yeah. Oh, I I didn't even think that was going to be a thing until maybe like season five, six. I didn't think we were going to get it in season two. Um, but you know what? It, it sets up a lot, right? Like it sets up a big story arc that can go through all these seasons. And I'm and I'm sure Nick can speak about it since he's seen all the seasons but um i i'm excited to see how they play with this right uh, i know you know as a, a little spoiler alert um if you've watched the mandalorian bo katan right that's that's a character that's a mandalorian character that's probably going to be huge in the clone wars um and that's why her appearance in the mandalorian is is so great if for for the fans that watch clone wars so i i, I i'm curious to see how much airtime death watch gets how much airtime the dark saber and that kind of story arc gets throughout the the seasons um but that is definitely one of one of the 
the coolest moments, I think, in my watching experience for season two. Yeah, Nick, I also think, I know you've seen this before, but for me, I think one of the highlights of the season was watching Obi-Wan fight the Death Watch leader with the Darksaber, the first lightsaber versus Darksaber battle. I thought that was pretty cool to revisit that. Yeah, and, you know, like, I've seen the show, you know, we, we, we definitely make that clear to the audience that I've seen it before, but I don't really remember a lot of this stuff. I haven't seen I, I stuff think Nick's seen the show before. I don't know if you guys know, but I think yeah. Nick's seen the show before. But I haven't seen it in years. So I really don't remember. Like, the episode we're watching, it seems new to me. I barely remember any of it. I just remember the plot points, really, until we get to, like, the, the recent season, like, season seven and a little bit of six also. But other than that, I don't remember the episode really at all. So this is kind of like a refresher for me, but absolutely – that was definitely the highlight of the season, in my opinion. And I think that arc is definitely the best arc. And I know you're going to want to get into what arc we like the most. And I've been thinking about it for a while because I wanted to, I didn't want to say this one because it seems like the obvious one. I wanted to try to find another one that I could possibly like say, well, this one was also good. Don't forget about that. I can't. This one it was that it was so much better than the other one. And I, I wanted, I really wanted to say like, oh, the first arc with the um, with Cad Bane might have been better, or the last arc with Boba Fett maybe, but I, I couldn't. This one for me is definitely the top arc of the season. Yeah, the thing I love about this one, this arc, is obviously I'm a little biased because I love Mandalorian. Some of this stuff ties into that, but from the jump, they had a clear idea of what they wanted to do. They had okay, here's our disconnect here between what Mandalorian society wants to be and what it actually is, where you have the group led by Duchess Satine saying, I want peace, blah, blah, blah. And I'm trying to not get, stay neutral in the war. And you have the traditional warriors like, screw this. We want to fight. We want to help the separatists, blah, blah, and so on and so forth. And I like they got into this right away and they've had misfire. You know how I feel about the pirates and how they mishailed that introduction, but they had this all lined up from the jump. I definitely agree. Um, you know, I was trying to think of something that I can possibly say, oh, you forgot to mention this, but I really can't. Like, they, they planned this out perfectly. I, I think, hopefully you agree, I think they handled the Pirates a lot better this season. I think Hondo, was, I know you didn't like Hondo in season one. I think Hondo was fine. I don't think he was annoying until you lost season one. No, Hondo, but, Hondo got, to, got a lot better in the finale season two. I did like what he was doing a lot better there. Yeah, and I just think that the entire Mandalore story arc I love how, you know, I say this all the time, but it adds more to the movies. It shows Obi-Wan Kenobi's backstory with, with the Duchess of Teen. Like, that is such a great thing to have in there that he has, like, some sort of path. Because Obi-Wan suffers from something in this show that no other character suffers from. And that's, he is zero, it's planned, too. He doesn't have character development on purpose. Because the way we see Obi-Wan in episode one, two, three, and four of the movies he doesn't really change. You know, Ewan McGregor does such a great job of playing the character that Alec Guinness made that, like, there's no change. Like, Anakin, you know, when we know what's going to happen to him, sure, but he goes from a good guy to a bad guy. There's development there to be seen. We could see his slow transition to the dark side. Obi-Wan doesn't have a transition. He starts good, he ends it. They need something for him. So throwing in that he has some sort of past relationship is something that he can do with the character. Otherwise, he'd just be there. Yeah, he has a great point considering that we have an Obi-Wan show in development on Disney Plus and it's coming yeah. out between the movies, set between episodes three and four. And I think it's a good point that, you know what, like a lot of season one, end of it, season two is like, oh, Anakin and Ahsoka, Anakin and Ahsoka. I like that Obi-Wan was the centerpiece here of the Mandalore plot. Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, I, I think to, to piggyback on what Nick was saying, I think that Obi-Wan doesn't get a lot of character development because of the whole Jedi way. And I think he's such a stickler for the Jedi way and not making connections. And we're just here to keep the peace. And if someone breaks the law and wants to kill me, I'm going to kill them. Like it's, he's a very structured general esque character. And I think that this shows a, a pain, almost a suffering that maybe Anakin feels a little bit uh, when it comes to episode three. And also that you see too, a little bit in these seasons of the Clone Wars that kind of connects Obi-Wan and Anakin a little bit more, right? Obi-Wan is calling Anakin, his brother in episode three um, in that fight in the Mustafar system and all that. And, and it's like, well, you kind of don't see that in the movies a little bit, right? We kind of see this master versus apprentice. Like you got to learn the ways I'm doing it. And you're being really stubborn about it. This is kind of showing, okay, maybe Obi-Wan understands Anakin a lot more than what's being alluded to in the movies. Yeah, Nick, another thing I just thought was very interesting of Pete 
brought the Anakin Obi Wan connection. That scene at the end of I forget which ep- episode of the arc it was when she was getting when Dutch Satine's getting framed for the plot to support the Separatists and Anakin Obi Wan that conversation in the at, in the ship at the end of the movie where Anakin sort of like pushing Obi Wan like oh did you have a romantic interest in Satine why didn't you pursue it knowing that we the audience know he's married to Padme secretly and the Jedi don't approve it he's sort of looking Obi Wan saying hey like why didn't you go out of this? And there are different points of view on the tally were interesting reminder. Yeah. And you know, in the movies, they kind of tell us that Obi-Wan knows about Anakin and Padme, but they never really said it for sure. So it's kind of an interesting point how you, how Anakin knows about Obi-Wan's past relations. But like, for example, at one scene in episode three, Anakin's like just sitting there and he goes, Obi-Wan's been here, hasn't he? And he's like, yeah, he came to check on you. And then at the end, um, when she sees that Padme is pregnant, he's like, Anakin's the father, isn't he? I, I, I don't know if he knows. I think he knows. I think he has a suspicion, but it's never been confirmed. But yeah, it's just kind of like, you know, it's full circle. It's now Anakin knows about something that Obi-Wan did in his past. But it's, as I mentioned, it's a good thing for Obi-Wan to have something to do because he's a very linear character in terms of development. And when it comes to his show that's going to be on Disney+, Plus, I think it's going to be a lot more about plot than development. I don't think there will be any development. I don't think his character develops at all. I think from when they introduced him as a how old he is in episode one, 20 year old guy with, with the with the, the uh, Padawan Bray, until he dies on the Death Star, he's pretty much the same. Like you mentioned, he sticks by the rules, he follows the Jedi code, he's the model Jedi. Yeah, that does make some sense. I think I was looking at more from Anakin's perspective, where I thought it was interesting that Anakin sort of like looking to Obi-Wan, sort of trying to get has to prove for his own decision without telling Obi-Wan. I thought that dynamic was fun. Yeah, and I wonder, though, because you say without telling him, I can't tell from watching episode three if Obi-Wan was told or not. And they don't show it in the universe anywhere. It's never, like, on screen. Maybe it's in a comic. I've never read or a book, something like that. But it, I can't tell if Obi-Wan actually knows in episode three. So maybe that conversation led nowhere. I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's something we should put up penny. Maybe if there's like a line in Clone Wars you can pick up later on that we'll see this. Maybe this so yeah. oh, hints it. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I who knows? It might be like a sensing thing, right? The Jedi Force is like I can feel in the Force. There's a disturbance in the Force, or they can feel, you know, when they first meet Anakin that wow, the the Force is strong with this particular youngling, right? Or he wasn't a youngling at that point; he was just a regular kid. And then they bring him into the Jedi Order, but um. Maybe, who knows maybe obi-wan just kind of has that feeling like yeah it's that's anakin's kid like i know i kind of know what's going on um and i feel like obi-wan as the negotiator right he's always referred to as a negotiator probably as a really good way of reading people in general not even just uh by the force and i know we're kind of getting a little off topic because we're talking about the clone wars but in the clone wars we see that general kenobi is a really good negotiator and really great at reading people and what's going to happen next and what the next move is so you know, to, to what Nick said, you know, like we said, he said, we don't really get that answer. It's not like handed out to us on a silver platter, but maybe the Clone Wars will allude to a little bit more about what Obi-Wan knows about Padme's relationship with Anakin. Yeah, I think we're going to put a pin in that, keep track of that as we go through future seasons of the show. One other arc I wanted to catch on before we go into some of our favorites is the Boba Fett arc at the end of season two, where we knew he was coming. Nick had given us a little tease at the end of the, at the season one podcast. He comes back at the end of season two. His whole thing is, I'm going to kill Mace Windu. We, the whole thing goes spectacularly sideways and then ends up being a disaster. And Nick, I have to say, I was a bit disappointed in Boba Fett's first appearance. I feel like he kind of underwhelmed. I agree and disagree. I think I completely agree. I completely disagree because I think the arc was really good. I think I, they did a good job with it. And I think it was well done and well executed i just re- i agree with you though i think the guy who played i don't know who it is i'm gonna look it up right now actually the voice of boba fett i thought he was awful awful yeah. i thought it was like the guy who played it was terrible i remember one of the lines i remember specifically was mace windu and him on the republic cruiser where he says he says um he says, he, he, Boba says to Mace, he goes, you killed my dad and I'm never going to forgive you. And he's like, well, you're going to have to. It just sounds very cringeworthy. Like the way his voice is just really bad. Like, and, but I think they did a good job though with the, I think the arc was okay. It makes sense that he'd want revenge on Mace Windu. I mean, I'm not against that at all. I just don't think that voice was good. No, I mean, the arc had some good twists and turns. I thought like you said, and Pete, I don't know if you feel this way. I feel like the, 
the voice acting role of that. Like he was so whiny in this in this arc. And I get, yes, he's still a kid at this point, but like they they could have done a better job getting a voice actor there. Of course they could, but it, let's let let me play devil's advocate here. He is a kid, right? Yeah. A kid that's being led by other bounty hunters to learn the ways of being a bounty hunter. He has this notion of, hey, Mace Windu killed my father. I want revenge. If you ever think or you ever hear a kid talking about revenge, it almost sounds whiny and kind of funny. Yeah. Right. Like if you're playing a game and you, you know, with younger siblings, or if you're playing a game as a young kid and you hear someone say, I'm going to get you back, it almost sounds like very whiny. So, yeah, the voice acting can always be better in, in these kind of shows this early. Again, it comes to budget, it comes to what kind of talent you can hire for something. You know, they wanted to put budget toward graphics versus voice acting for a new character that shows up one episode. Maybe they didn't want to break the bank and who played that well, one character. Well, to, to, sorry to cut you off, but I looked into it and I have to take back what I said. I mean, he didn't do well. I'm not going to argue and say he did, but the only person who could have played him played him. And yeah. Not only, but the Daniel Logan played him who plays Boba Fett in Attack of the Clones. That's interesting. So it, does, it adds up. That, that is the voice, but it you could have done anything because it's a voice act. You could have done someone else, but it adds up. Well, to, to, to piggyback on that point, you know, radio's, radio is a lot different than TV when it comes to broadcasting and how you say things, right? So yeah. maybe that actor is good on camera, but he's not good voice acting. It almost, he, hasn't, he hasn't really been maybe, in anything. So like know. maybe like, you know, he couldn't get into character sitting behind a microphone like we're doing watching a TV screen trying to lip sync what's going on, on in the animation. So yeah. it could have been a, a plethora of factors. Obviously, like you said, like, how can you not do a great Boba Fett when the kid played Boba Fett in Attack of the Clones? Um, so, it, again, you can always do better with voice acting. They could have hired a professional voice acting child or a voice actor that could do a child's voice well. They did budgetary things. But I also think, too, like, he's a kid. You know, he's whiny. He doesn't know how to control his emotions. He doesn't know what revenge is. Right, like, how old could Boba Fett be in this? Thirteen. Oh, he's so he's, a, he's, a, he's an unaltered clone. He's ten or eleven. Right. So, I mean, think about a ten or eleven. You'll come to you saying, "I hate you. I you killed my father. I'm never going to forgive you." Yeah. It sounds whiny. So, it, yes, I agree with all the points that you're saying, Mike, and you're saying Nick. But like, maybe that was the direction that he got when he was doing the voice acting. And yeah, maybe you know, I've I've learned to not criticize when it comes to a lot of the acting in Star Wars, because then you hear a lot about years later, like Hayden Christensen, I'm not going to defend him and say he did so well. We've talked about this before on this. and said, that's the way he was designed. Lucas told him to do that. He's like, yeah, you want to sound this way. And I had mentioned it that one time when we said we were going to look for a voiceover on yep. YouTube where the lines he says, imagine them in Darth Vader's costume talking that way. And you're like, oh, that actually kind of makes sense. Yeah. I think also maybe for me, part of the I think maybe this arc was one episode too long. I think this would have played better as a two-parter. I think dragging the hostage part out for another whole, a third episode, I think also hurt it in my opinion. I like the last one. Yeah, I think the middle um, part was the one where we had the issue. Yeah, was that the R2? I think it was the R2 one. Yeah, that was the R2 one where Anakin and Mace Windu are trapped on the destroyed ship and R2 has yeah. to escape the thing and say that. I think we could have yada yada all that and just gotten to a, better, a more cohesive part two. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I feel like that that episode kind of shows how close they got. I mean, you have to you have to give Boba Fett respect in the later films, right? Because he is a good bounty hunter. So maybe this was trying to be a play at look. Like, yes, other bounty hunters are teaching him. This is what he's learning. He got really close to killing Anakin Skywalker and Mace Windu in one shot. Yeah, true. So I, I want maybe- to touch on two things when it comes to this arc. Um, number one, real quick, is. Anakin is with Mace Windu, pretty much the entire arc, right? Can we yes. all agree there? Yes. Yeah. I just find it odd that in episode three, he said he tells him that he believes Chancellor Palpatine is a Sith Lord, and then he says, if what you told me is true, you will have gained my trust. Like, how is this not enough for him to trust him? Like, them working together like this, surviving, getting out of tight spots, I feel like he should have trusted him by now. I think that's also the problem with that is this just came after episode three. Yeah. So, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because that's the issue is like you're, you can't really like the movie that's supposed to be after this came out first. It's, you're having running the problem when you're having the comments where you're trying to retcon it and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's, a continuity, yeah. it's a continuity issue, of course. But I also think that Mace Windu ever trusted Anakin ever about anything, even if he was right. I mean, I just don't think Anakin Skywalker sat well with Mace Windu ever, whatever he did. Uh, Anakin was so 
outspoken about, I want to be a master. I want to do this. I'm ready. I'm ready. And Mason was like, no, you're not. You're impatient. I, who, who knows? I mean, it's a continuity error, 100%. But I, I mean, I maybe it. too, just the character of Mace Windu, just not trusting, I mean, anyone. I mean, I don't think he trusted anyone in any kind of sort of situation. Uh, maybe, maybe that's just his character, but that's just me playing devil's advocate. And the other thing I wanted to touch on is the the bounty hunter that kind of takes him in. I believe, her, I don't know how to pronounce her first name, Aura. It's Aura Singh. Aura Singh, and her last name Singh. Yeah, Aura Singh. So, she is, I just want to point this out because I didn't want this to go unnoticed without her character kind of going away. Is she's a she plays off as a pretty badass bounty hunter, right? I think we can all agree that on that. Yeah, she, it, she's actually brought up in the movie Solo. Um, when they go to the bar or the, the arena where they where, where um, they find Lando and his droid L3, it's brought up that Tobias, the character that uh, Woody Harrelson plays killed Aura Singh and that's what gives him this big like oh my god that's Tobias he killed Aura Singh he killed Aura Singh and that's, I think that's a pretty cool connection that they had of the Clone Wars and Solo and like they don't really show us how she how he killed her or when that happened but it's just interesting that she comes up again and I don't want that to go unnoticed without you know with her character going away yeah it's definitely an interesting point so I think also we kind of covered these two big arcs let's talk about some of the other ones I mean Nick you said it your your favorite arc is still the Mandalore arc yeah, I mean, I tried for a while to think of one that was better, but I just can't, couldn't think of one. I did like, I just want to throw out an episode that I liked a lot. If you guys didn't agree, don't agree, but I liked it a lot. I can't remember the what number or episode it was, but I just remember what happened is that the, the village was being attacked, and they had to train the villagers to be warriors, and I just thought that was a good episode. I don't know, I just thought it was, I just thought it was executed really well. I just didn't have any issues with it. It was easy to follow. I wanted to see what happened. It just wasn't like a boring episode. It was, a, I think it was a one episode arc. And it was just yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I remember. It was, I think it was the one right before the, they had the, the I think it was maybe like episode 16 somewhere in there because I know they had the two episodes where they were trying to bring the creature back. And then they had the three at the end of the season. I remember that one. It's like Anakin, Ahsoka, and Obi Wan with the four bounty hunters trying yeah, to protect Episode 17 is what it was. Yeah, that was a, I thought it was a good episode. I know Hondo showed up. So I know you must have loved it. <laughs> Pete, what about you? What other episodes did you like this season? I, I really liked the episode, and I can't remember the the whole plot of the episode because I'm a binge guy, right? So, like, when I in, intake it a lot at once, it's kind of hard to remember exactly everything that happened in the episode. But there was an episode where I feel like Anakin Skywalker's character development takes another notch towards Darth Vader, like a huge notch, and he has a separatist general or a separatist leader or something like that in a cell and he's trying to get information on i believe if they have a soaker or something like that and he beats the living crap out of him to get the information yeah and then if you noticed in the background they play the imperial march theme when he does that if you listen see i didn't even i didn't even catch that but that's very interesting so like that to me was a huge episode even if that one minuscule thing that you don't all right, you don't really see him do it but it's implied right the dude looks half dead after anakin's done with him but he wants answers. He'll do anything. Break Jedi code. He'll beat you half to death to get the answer. And that's something that shows the frustration and the anger and the, I need answers. Now you're going to give them to me because I care about X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think that was a huge, huge, huge plot plot moment for Anakin's character. Yeah. I think that was the episode with the brain, with the brain worms that were sort of like taking over like people's minds. I think and he was beating up Pop little lesser to get the information. I think that's what, that's what it was. And that sounds about right. Like I said, because yeah, I must have been a geonosis. Yeah, because I binge all these episodes, it's sometimes harder for me to like remember every key point. I probably should do what you do, Mike, and do like two episodes a week, but or however many episodes a week. But I uh, I decide to binge. So yeah, yeah. So I think for me, I think I'm gonna give the the premiere arc some love because Cad Bane throughout the premiere, I he's just such, such a badass, one step ahead of the Jedi the entire way. I yeah. mean, you you saw the first two episodes, you see how you think he's dead. Then he sneaks off the ship and poses a clone trooper. And then he just one ups the Jedi the whole way through. I thought it was pretty cool watching his like cat and mouse, the Obi-Wan just winning every step of the way. My season one MVP. Yeah. Cat Bane. And I, I just had a weird question. Maybe I missed it when it comes to this arc. He's hired by um, Lord Sidious, right? Yep. Why? They have Sith. Why doesn't he just use Dooku for the same thing? I just, I just don't get it. Why did he hire someone if he didn't have to? No, I think Dooku, 
I, I don't know. Again, this is one where I had to look at the timing because I know the timeline's off in terms of like when this actually is because they right. aired them out of the viewing order. So like, yep. maybe he's one of those things where like he had such a reputation of being so skilled and they had specific skill set that he could provide and he's some of the drugs yeah, that I put. So. It just seemed confusing to me. I just didn't understand. I, I mean, maybe maybe they he hired an outside bounty hunter that has nothing to do with the separatists to kind of get the heat off the separatists for like a little bit because obviously he's on both sides, right? So the, yep. the he has to play both sides. He has to say, well, we need to defeat the separatists, but like he wants the separatists to win for his own personal gain because he's the leader of the Sith. So like that's that's his thing. So maybe he was trying to like take the heat off the separatists for a little bit and say, hey, look, we have this bounty hunter that's trying to kill all these senators and they took hostages and look, we need to get this guy justice. We he needs to do all these things like go into the the Jedi Temple, go to the get the uh whatever it was called the the key uh, whatever it is. Holocron. Holocron. Like maybe maybe they wanted the Jedi to focus on this one guy to take the heat off Dooku and Grievous because it, if you notice too in this in this season. The separatists are mentioned and they pop up, but they're not as prominent as they are in season one. I feel like everything yeah. separate to separate to separate to separatists, right? This season is very like there's other things going on that they have to deal with. The separatists is an o- overlying tone of it. It's an overlying theme, but we don't see we see Dooku in what? Maybe two episodes. We don't see Grievous. Do we see Grievous at all? I can't remember. There's so one one arc with Grievous. Maybe one maybe episode actually. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, when Obi Wan finally thinks he's gonna kill him, or Grievous thinks he's gonna kill Obi Wan, there's like that whole plan. So like, I maybe that was it. Maybe it's like let's take the heat off the separatists so they can keep doing what they're doing without so much backlash from us. From yeah. Us. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I, I definitely see that. And um, I also. You know, so, so, so sorry, Mike. There's something that I really like to do when I watch Star Wars, especially anything that takes place before Episode Three. So it would be this show, or Episode One or Two, or even in the middle of Three. Is we know what happens in Three. We know the big plan. We know Order Sixty Six. Make Darth Vader the bad guy. You know, or Anakin. You know, have him come to the other, to the dark side. But I like just to think about at what point in time did his plans change? Because clearly in Episode One, he already had the plan. Palpatine is what he was going to do. But it didn't involve Anakin. He didn't know who Anakin was. So I like to just think, like, at, at this point in the Clone Wars, did he want Count Dooku to be his apprentice with the Empire? Did he want Anakin? When did that shift? Was it originally supposed to be Maul forever? Did he plan for Maul to die? Or should I say die? But, like, you know, that's just an interesting thing that we don't really know. And I think that's I think that's the best thing in Star Wars, in my opinion, is Palpatine's takeover. It's like a genius plan. And I just I love dissecting the plan as much as I can. Yeah, sort of build on that for a second there. I think one interesting thing about that opening arc was that the whole thing was that they needed Cad Bane to steal the holocron to sort of kill the younglings who were four cents before they become Jedi. So you see that he's already thinking about this. Like, you know, like I gotta get the young ones killed before they can actually come Jedi and give me problems in the future. So a lot of everything. Yeah, a lot of everything. And this is one where it makes sense where he goes to Cad Bane because Count Duke can't exactly just walk into the Jedi library and say, hey, give me the holocron. So they needed bounty hunters who are skilled at being deceptive and that one changeling who could approximately cost a new and steal the holocron. Yeah, I also enjoyed the episode that was right after that arc, which is um, Padme's ex-boyfriend and her, and he was being, and he was the, um, he's like a spy, like working with the separatists and like, they, you know, you, you know the episode. I just enjoyed that one. I thought there was just, I another one that was like a single episode plot, or no, it really wasn't. There was an arc to it, but just one that's easy to follow there's not like a lot of, I don't want to say boring part. It's, it's political, yes, but like, I don't know. I, maybe the politics are for me. I like the politics of Star Wars. I like the prequels. I like episode one. I, I, I enjoy the trade barriers. Maybe I'm alone. All right, so leave Nick alone on that. Let's go the other direction. Let's go to the worst arcs of episodes this season. Pete, what one did you want to forget about after you watched it? I absolutely hated the investigator when the senators were <laughs> That guy was the most annoying thing, except for obviously Zero Hut. But that guy, I wanted to punch through the TV screen. And that episode, to me, was useless. Yeah. It was absolutely useless. That has got to be the worst story arc of this season to me. And I don't know if you guys agree with me, but the whole poisoning the the uh, the senators and, oh, you know, the it, just the whole arc was just so unnecessary. And then that investigator just added so much more crap to it like i no nah, just we're, we're, i didn't need it didn't need it nikki Nick, I, 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 I agree i completely agree i, I nothing to add nothing to, uh, one thing to add maybe but 
nothing to take away. It's just, I, yeah, it, there was no need for the episode. You could have completely erased it 100%, and the show would have been exactly the same. Yeah, I think two other ones I'm going to throw in there. Because obviously, I, I hate the, inspe- in, the inspector guy, and they're going to get to him in a bit. But I think two have to be heavy. Number one is think the the Geonosis arc goes on for too long. We don't need five episodes of it. And I think the the mind worm part where they're going underground and they, they have the worms take over people's brains, like that's a direct ripoff of Star Trek Two, the, the Rat the Con, where they have the parasite worms. And that one bothered me because I thought it was very poorly executed, the homage there. I think also the episode where Ahsoka loses her lightsaber, we did not really need that either. I really this was bothered by that one because I just really, like, again, I sort of with this one. I think we could have erased that because at what point did she apply the lesson she learned going forward? Yeah, that episode in particular, I think was executed fine. I don't have any issues with the episode itself, but I agree, just, you don't really need it. It's not that it was a bad episode, it was just unneeded. Yeah, and- Pete, what did you think about the episode where Ahsoka had her lightsaber stolen? You know, I think it's something that could have been touched upon in a different episode just to show her immaturity still as a Jedi. I think we see her skill a lot in this season, so we kind of forget that she is just a Padawan and she is still a little stubborn little brat sometimes and thinks she can do everything. So, like, I think it was important to see her lose her lightsaber. I just don't think we need to dedicate a whole episode to it. I think they could have been something very, very easier that could have been done where she lost her lightsaber in battle and Anakin found it and Anakin was like don't ever lose this lose this again and like grounds her a little bit um not ground in the sense of like go to your room but like takes her down a notch and says look I told you not to lose this and you lost it so you got to go do x y and z or something something like that um didn't have to be a full episode to me I, you know, I got to say, there's really only one, like, line in the whole episode that matters. And, like, that doesn't need to be an episode. That can just be thrown into a line. I think the whole point of the episode is to show, in episode two, Attack of the Clones, Anakin loses his lightsaber in the beginning. And Obi-Wan says, this weapon is your life. Like, you can't lose it. And then she says, in the episode, Master Anakin always tells me this weapon is my life. So it shows that he learned the lesson. You could have done that in, a, in, a, in less than 22 minutes. You could have shown that he learned the lesson. Mm-hmm. That could have been a C plot of an episode where you could have spent like three minutes total on it and then had it. Yeah. You didn't right. need it. During a lightsaber battle and she misplaces it or leaves it on a ship or something, the ship flies away, you know, and Rex gives it back to her. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just something that could like be easily done in a five minute span that could be like, oh crap, I shouldn't have done that, you know? But you know what? We have 133 episodes of this show. We've watched, what, 42? 44. 44. Yeah. So we're going to have some episodes that we don't need. At least, <laughs> I'd say at least. No, you're at right. least at least 33 of them we're not going to need. Yeah, I think for yeah. sure. And I think also we're at that point of the Sky Guys podcast. We're updates of our ongoing tracker we have going on throughout the show. So we have a meter going up right now of how many times Padme Amidala gets captured in the show. It's stayed at four. She's not going to capture it all in season two. So progress on the right, right. Is there. So can I can I object to that in a, in a way? Sure. So the episode that Nick was talking about where the ex-boyfriend or whatever, like, Rush Clovis is his name. Yes, the, the, the beautiful name of Rush Clovis. Um, could you possibly make the argument that she kind of got captured because she was poisoned to try to hold her hostage to get an antidote? I don't like, think it was that. a play to try to get an antidote and she had to like stay technically and, and the way it worked out, she didn't, but she kind of like got played into you know being captured in a way. I don't, I don't think that's the same thing. I think that really Louis is just like she All got right. poisoned. She definitely got tricked. She got tricked without oh, captured. All right, so we'll go. We'll go with trick then. That's not. Fine. That's 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 a that's still out of four because it, they learn progress. Of the writers there from actually giving her something different to do other than get captured every episode. Perfect. That's that's one tracker. Number two is our zero the hut tracker. No appearances in season two, so he's still at two total. Yes, zero appearances for zero. Love it. Love to see it. That's a great, it's a great omen for us. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this now, and I'm going to say this every time we update this tracker, I want to make this 100% clear to everyone who listens or watches, however you get this media, Zero the Hut is the worst character in the history of media. <laughs> Not even just Star Wars, of media. Media. I will say that every time we do the tracker. All right, so we'll put that in there. And we have to update the Hondo tracker. He is now up to four appearances on the show. And I will say... Number four was probably my favorite appearance of Hondo because this is actually him being a fun pirate where he's sort of like, hey, like, I'm not involved here. He's playing both sides. I appreciate that more than him just being a one-note jerk in season one. 
I think that's the Honda we're going to get, or I know that the Honda we're going to get for the rest of the time, you know, Honda. Yeah. Made him popular enough to put him in Disney World. He's on that ride. Was it Smuggler's Run? Is that the one of it? Yep. Yeah. They, they, he, you know, he, he, his ridiculous appearance in season one didn't get him that role. Yeah. Yeah. P, I liked him much better because, like, especially the finale where he's helping the bounty hunters and I, forget, I think which, forget which Jedi shows up to come deal with him. He's like, hey, like, they're in there. And, and, and Jedi, like, why are you helping? He's like, I'm, I know better than the best of you guys. You guys are, you guys are really good at what you do. So, good yeah, job. I mean, I he's got to, he's got to play both sides of the coin, right? I mean, as a, as a pirate or as like a, a businessman, if you want to even get that, that deep, I mean, he's got to play both sides because if he needs the Jedi to help him one day, he knows he can say, Hey, you remember when I gave you that heads up, you know, same thing with the bounty hunters. Hey, remember when I gave you that heads up or I gave you a place to stay. So he's playing his cards. He's playing his cards, right? He knows what he's doing. You know, I'm sure there's going to be times he's against the Jedi, and sometimes he's going to be for the Jedi. It's just, it's bound to happen. All right. We had those and, and update. Now we'll go to our MVP tracker and, I updated the board here. So last time I gave out partial points, everybody gets a full point here for our grades. So to make it easier for me to track this. So as, as of right now, we have on the MVP tracker, we have Anakin Skywalker in the lead with two points. Padme has one. Obi-Wan has one. Cad Bane with one. And Jar Jar Binks, thanks to me, is on the board with the point. So next, I will give you the floor first. You have up, up to three MVP points options for this season what do you want to do with them yeah I'll, I'll tell you my answer first and then i'll explain them i'll give two to anakin one to obi-wan okay. so i'll start with obi-wan with the one point i think that him just being involved in that mandalore plot and him being referred to as the negotiator more and more just shows why obi-wan is the most consistently good character in all of star wars there's never a time people complain about him he's the bright spot of the prequels he's a great character in the original trilogy I, there's no one out there who dislikes Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's a great character, and this is only adding to it. It just shows more about him, more about his past. Anything more Obi-Wan is good. And it's, but there's really, I don't think there's really anything they can do that would ruin his character unless they show that all of a sudden he doesn't follow the Jedi Code anymore for no reason. But like they would never do that. So I would think that his character is really good and is going to remain really good. There's nothing they can do to make it worse. And then Anakin... Not, I guess it's not so much Anakin as much as it is the writers and whatnot, but it's what Pete mentioned earlier. They are working in the right direction to, you know, in the movies he went from little kid, bigger kid who's whiny, Darth Vader. Yep. Now it's, how did that happen? They're showing us and right now in front of our eyes. We're seeing it and it's making sense and it's making me, and I've already, you know, I've already went through this journey and I've already done this numerous times with watching episode three but it makes me feel for Anakin in episode three feel for Anakin in the original trilogy and Vader knowing that there's a person under there and, and, and that people love and respect him and you know and it makes it's the story of Star Wars is the tragedy of Darth Vader not anything else and you feel for the character now and it's showing you why yeah I think I think that's a good call and Pete your MVPs who you have for season two I'm going to flip-flop what Nick did. So I'm going to give two points to Obi-Wan, one point to Anakin. And the reason why I'm going to give one point to Anakin is because of my knowledge bias, I guess I would call it, because we kind of know what direction Anakin is going in. Yes, there was a lot of important points. Like, again, when he beats up that separatist general or captain, whatever he is, uh, huge, huge plot point that needs to be addressed when it comes to Anakin's character development. I just feel that, Obi-Wan gets more because we're finally, finally seeing something more about Obi-Wan than here's the rules. We're going to execute them. Go do your job. And I think that he gets more points in the sense that you can see he gets annoyed with Duchess Satine. And that might be because of the feelings he had for her or has for her. And you don't really see Obi-Wan get super annoyed. You see him get like, okay, you're being stubborn. I know how to handle it. Anakin, whatever. I see him get super annoyed, you know, when he when Satine's trying to help him survive, and he's like, "Well, you got to do something now, or I'm gonna get crushed." Like he's getting kind of little little uh, sassy. He's getting a little snippy, a little snips. He's the new snips now this season. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think I think his character development, I don't want to say it was more important, but at least we got more than we ever gotten for the character. So that's why I give him more points. Okay, so that's Pete on the board. I'm going, I'm splitting my three, one for three different characters. I'm going to jump on the Obi-Wan train. I'm giving him a point because he makes the Mandalore arc because 
I don't think they could have given this to Anakin had it be successful. I think Obi-Wan's presence, giving him the backstory as a teen, I think his involvement with that and his general presence in these battles this season, he gets a point for me. I'm going to do a Nick here and give a point to Cad Bane. I'm giving him one here because the most successful bounty hunter of the season, he executes his plot pretty flawlessly. The things that lose, they're not his fault. It's often because his underlings suck and he gets the job done. He gets away scot-free. Nobody comes near him and then he's three and out. He don't see him again the rest of the year. It's a good job from him. I'm going to get the last one. I'm going to get Mace Windu on the board here. I think he had a pretty strong season. He has some good presence in the battles. And I think his arc with the with the right with the Ryloth beast or whatever it's whatever the name of it is. And the, um, he's the, a the Zillow beast. The Villa, Zillow beast. He's on the right side of that from the jump. And he clearly knows that Palpatine is being shady about it. And he's distrusting him of that. So I'm giving him the point there for at least starting to realize that something is wrong with, with, with Palpatine. You know, I would have thrown Cad Bane in there too. I think that him having the episodes when he did, they were just so, to me, it's so long ago when I watched them that it's like, it just it wasn't as fresh in my mind to give him the points. And I wish they had maybe spread him out to the season a little bit more and that would have made him feel like he was there more. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Let's also go to the LVP ranks. Let's go the other way in terms of the worst characters of the show. So on the board last season, we only gave out three of these. Zero has two of the three. And from Pete and Nick, I gave Padme the LVP point because I could not just give it to a character that appeared for about 10 seconds in one episode. So now we're going to have some fun with the LVPs. Uh, Pete, I'll start with you first. Who are the worst characters of the season? All right, so I'm going to take my three points. I'm going to spread them out. One, one, and one. Okay. First point, I'm giving to that stupid investigator from that Senate thing. <laughs> Throw him in there. I don't even know his name. Just put investigator. Just least valuable. Play. Like, just get out of here. Yeah, We don't need you, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing, and I, I can't – I'm so upset that I can't remember this general's name. starts with an A, I believe. We, uh, they were trying to do the supply drop to him. Um, he's in all the episodes, too. Could, could not be with an A, too. But he's one of the generals, and he's on the planet, and he needs help and support. And uh, it's, the, it's the episode where Anakin is in the, the stealth ship. Oh, the one where he defies the general? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So – I, I can't remember the guy's name. I know he's been in past movies and stuff like that. I hated that he pulled the you're my only hope card. <laughs> I hated that. He's like, you're my only hope. Obi-Wan, your only hope. I'm like, I can't. I No, I can't do this. So he gets an LVP point. And uh, I give Zero the Hut an LVP point because he's just that bad. He wasn't even on the season. I don't care. He was just that bad. He gets. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask if we were allowed to give people LVP points who are not in the season. <laughs> is, is that he a yes? Another point. No, he's, you can't give him a point. He was not here. He, All he, right, he, fine. So I'll, I'll give the inspector two points, and I'll give uh, General whatever his name is. Got to find that name. Yeah, I got I got. All right. All right so, um, Nick, what about you? Who are your LVPs? So... No, zero is not here, so I have to change some some things around. I'm going to give zero two points, but no, I, I, honestly, it's going to sound a little strange because he's not in that much. But my answer is Chancellor Palpatine for all three. Yeah, okay. I just think I know it's a show. I know it's a show made for kids. I know it's a cartoon, and I know it's a show where we already know the outcome, being that it takes place in between two movies, right? But this guy is like, it's so clear that he's evil. It's like. It's like it's it's like he's not even trying to hide it. Like when the whole thing with the Zillow beast, like the whole way that he wants to kill, like it's just so obvious that he's playing both sides. And I know we only know that because we already know that watching the show that he's playing both sides. But I feel like he's not trying to hide it at all. And yeah. it's just and I just can't get behind it. I think he is maybe the best character in the prequel movies outside of like Obi Wan. I think Obi Wan is just such a per like we've mentioned it before, like how Ian McGregor just nailed the character, but. I, I think he's so such a great character in the movies and to see him like this in the show where it's just like, dude, it's obviously you. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like you're getting him all three of your points. Yeah. I think he's just not hiding it. Again, I know it's a show. I know it's a show for kids. I know all that, but like dude, hide it a little bit. Like he's even had like six statues in his office. Like how, what's going on? Like how does no one pick up on this guy? <laughs> Are we, Maybe I, I'll give you a suggestion here. Maybe you want to listen to this, son. Maybe give him two and dock the Jedi as a whole one point for not picking up on any of the things he's laying down. You know what, though? I, I, I could agree that it's not just the Jedi. It's Padme. It's the entire Senate. So you can knock down the entire Republic if you want. 
<laughs> oh, it's just, it's oh, so oh, obvious. Oh, and even and even the separatists, like the separatists, know him as Darth Sidious. They don't know him as the Chancellor, so they don't know. Like even they're falling for it too. So it's everyone in the universe or the galaxy except him. All right. Like so- in Episode Three, when they when they kidnap him at the beginning of the movie. Grievous thinks he kidnapped the enemy bad guy. Like he doesn't know that it's also his boss. He doesn't know that. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. So I think we're we'll leave them like for now because I give yeah. a point to everybody. Well, we have to give every single person in the universe an LVP point for that. So we'll give oh. a, we'll double on Palpatine. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to I want to redeem myself here because I'm an idiot. Yeah. It was a senator. It wasn't a general. It was Senator Organa from Alderaan. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking A for Alderaan because I'm a moron. But I believe, if I'm correct, in one of the episodes, Damn. he's on he's on one of the planets waiting for a supply drop, and he sends a transmission in. He goes, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're our only hope, and I wanted to hit him. Yeah. Like, so, that is Leia's line. I feel like that's why they gave it to him because it's, it's her dad. I don't care. <laughs> it's just... It just hurts so hard to hear that. You know, I actually think the episode you're talking about is the the cat and mouse episode. Yes. Yeah. Which just yeah. a fun fact, that is the first episode chronologically, even before the movie. That's the first episode ever. Oh. Just fun fact. I did throw it in season two at the end, but it's that's the first thing chronologically. In the timeline of Clone Wars. Like that's yeah. If, if they had done it as a chronological, it's only in episode one. Yeah, and also we're getting to the end of that. I believe after season three, there's no more ridiculous order and everything just flows. So yeah. that's good. So only one more season of things that are out of order. All right. So that, now I'm up for the I'm LVP board. I'm gonna, again, I spread mine across the board. I threw another one, Pete, on. I put him in the document as investigator douche. So he's in the point. He's getting a third LVP point from us. So the good. worst character of the show outside of zero so far. Good. I think this guy is so useless. He's whining and he's talking constantly about like, you should let me do my job. And he's just talking in circles and not actually doing his job. And it takes two random senators who have no experience being PIs to solve the crime and that he's hired to solve. So terrible job, investigator douche. And he's condescending as hell. So he gets an LVP point for me. I think that's one. Number two, I'm giving, I'm docking Ahsoka for losing the lightsaber because that episode was terrible. And I feel like <laughs> you, you can't get away with that one. You get an LVP for me from that because you're a Jedi, as Obi Wan said. Your lightsaber is your life, and she lost, got pickpocketed, which is pretty terrible. That's one for me. And third one, I'm giving an LEP point to Luminara, the Jedi who basically is the ripoff of Spock, and from the Genosis arc. Mm-hmm. We're utterly useless character, literally no personality, complete ripoff of Spock from the Star Trek movies. Luminara gets the third LEP for me. She has a small scene in. Uh, episode three, and I think it's the most ridiculous scene ever to make. To, to they want you to care about the characters in the movie, and the fact that she is in maybe four seconds of the camera scrolling by really gets on my nerves. Like she's in episode two, I think. I believe she's in episode one also. But like, how, I don't. I'm not sure that's someone. But like, how how do you like expect us to care when they show Order sixty six? Like, of course we care when. We see, you know, Mace Windu get killed, and when they try to kill Obi Wan, and then like they show like four random Jedi, and we're like, oh, I remember him from one scene. I really wish they did a better job with that in the movie. They, you know, and I I say this all the time when it comes to the sequel movies and the prequel movies. Why did it have to be a trilogy? Why couldn't it be four? If they made it four, it would have been so. It could have explored so much more material, and it could have been so much better. It didn't have to be three, just because the first one was three. It all have to be three. Yeah, well, the problem with that theory is that, like, obviously they called the first one episode four, so it's kind of hard to do four and say, well, you could do this one. Well, they they didn't call it four until retroactively until they decided to make one. Yeah. So they could have just made it five at the time. And on the side note is the investigator, just so we, just so this is known for, I just think it's funny, the voice actor is the same voice actor who does SpongeBob. I think that's funny. (laughs) (laughs) Don't tarnish SpongeBob's name. By attaching that to this investigator, I take personal offense to this. No, that's that. Okay. Hey, well, inv- investigator, he, he, he does a lot of voice acting. Yeah, yeah. yeah a lot they usually do. Yeah, a lot of the cartoon voice actors do a lot in cartoons, and you just don't really recognize them because they're good voice actors. They do different voices, so that's and interesting. The dog, I never realized this. He plays the dog in Cat Dog and Spyro the Dragon from Spyro the Dragon. They know that interesting things. That, that is interesting. I'm sure if you listen to like if you listen to like Spyro or Cat Dog again, you'd hear SpongeBob in the voice if you listen closely. Yep. 
Yeah, I just think this character was just so horribly written and so horribly designed that like his storyline was so atrocious. He had to be our our least valuable character of the season by far. You know it's impactful when he's only in, I think it's two episodes, and it's clear that he's like an LVP. And I would throw him in there too. And it just I saw something on YouTube earlier today, actually, that was mentioning how no one picks up on Palpatine. And I'm like, that's my LVP, 100%. Yeah, investigator do should get an extra LVP point because he was also working with Palpatine and did not pick up on any of these things either. No one did. No one did. Yeah, Nick, if you want, we can give you we can give you, we can give a ghost point to the investigator douche every season he's not in. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He can get a ghost point for him, but I can't put a ghost point on zero. I I, I would have to say I definitely hate both characters, but if you ask me for a spin-off show featuring one of the two, I have to pick him over the other. <laughs> I would totally watch that show <laughs> just to rip it apart. Yeah. So that's, that's what we have for the LVP ranking right now. Investigator douche is taking the lead. But I suspect next time we see zero, he's going to climb right back on top of that leaderboard. Yeah. Anytime zero appears in a season, he'll get at least one of my points. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's our leaderboard there. And last but not least, we do the season ranking. So are you still going in order? We're going season two, season one of the movie. Yep. Yep, I think I agree with that. All right. I, so, want to, I want to ask both of you guys. So, when it comes to writing, directing, acting, animation, is there anything you think was better about season one than season two? Anything? I would say probably not. I don't think so. I I think I think the the character models look better, like you were explaining. I, I just can't. I understand it's a cartoon. I can't get over how fast the fighting scenes are, how fast their joints move. Like I get their Jedi, and I get it's a cartoon. Slow it down a bit. No one moves that way. Even the Jedi in the film, because they literally can't moves the way that they do. And it just I can't get past that cartoony fight part. Like the lightsaber battles are cool when they have that with the dark saber versus Obi Wan. That was a really cool fight scene. If the motions were just a little bit more realistic, I would appreciate it so much more. Yeah. I read somewhere that the motions were all motion captured. I wonder if that starts in a certain season or if it's got to because this is way no one's swinging and fighting that quickly. Right. Because I watched it um, in the cartoon. I, I get it, but I actually watched one of the episodes from season seven today earlier in the day just because I wanted to. And the lightsaber fight seems a lot more realistic. So I wonder if they start bringing in motion capture later on. And, we'll, and if so, we'll note it down and we'll take note of when that starts. Right. Yeah, I feel like these first seasons, Pete makes a good point. It feels a lot like they saw the Yoda fight in episode two where he's flipping and kicking all over the place at ridiculous speeds. They said, we want that in the cartoon. Right. But again, yeah. he's CGI'd. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's easy to make him, and he's also Yoda. I mean, come on. So, right, yeah, he's the only character that could have gotten away with that. Right. But now you're doing that with every character, and it's, it's a little ridiculous. But again, yeah. as you pointed out, I pointed out earlier, it is a cartoon, it is a TV show, but yeah, you want it to be as realistic as possible. All right, so that's pretty much the wrap on season two. And season three, we'll be back about a month again doing this one. The subtitle here is season is Secrets Reveal. Another 22 episodes. Nick, any memories from season three you want to set us up for? No. It's a secret, Mike. <laughs> it's a secret. I don't have anything to share because it is a secret, but I do have to share with you is that season four is when the show really really picks up no there is actually not uh, there is one thing in season three that's huge there's a new character that we're going to get and i think he's gonna i'm already gonna say this now he or she or it will be one of at least one of my mvp points at the end of the season i'm not gonna spoil on who it is but there's a new character coming and i'm really excited for its introduction all right, so this will be interesting and i also i'm curious i'm looking forward to seeing if we get more of the bounty hunters again because I need more Cad Bane in my life after this, after this that the very brief bit of him we got this season. I feel like it's biased now. Um, like, yeah, I can't Cad remember Bane. if there is, but I, I want to give us three, um, two notes on the season to look forward to. Number one, I'm not going to tell you when this stuff will happen, but number one is there's a new character. I already picked up on that. And number two is there's one character who is only ever in the movies who we've never seen in this show before who we're going to see again, and it's just nice to see. All right, that's good. Not, a, not that this character plays a prominent, like a huge role, but it's just cool to see this character again. All right, cool. So we'll keep a few of them, actually. Actually, I want to take that back. Maybe there's two or three of them that we're going to see, like in one episode. And it's like, wow, look who it is. 
Yeah, I think it'll be cool. So good, good to know. That's our season two coverage here on Sky Guys. We'll be back for season three in about a month. And I well, thank you guys for coming on. Give you a chance to plug your social media. Pete, how about you? How would you like the people to follow you on social media? As always, you can follow me on Twitter at PJConsidori29. A lot of hockey stuff out there. Maybe I'll do a little bit of Star Wars. Maybe we'll switch it up. I'm always retweeting your podcast, Mike. So if you ever want to see Mike's podcast, I'm usually throwing them up there too. So yeah, go and follow me. All right, Nick. Obviously, Nick is obviously one of those guys. He's he's a, more of a Twitter lurker, and he wants to follow you. So leave your hashtags in the YouTube version of this video. Leave your leave your handles. He will follow you. We got. Yeah, I, I started getting going on Twitter a little bit. I haven't tweeted really, but I started following some people, and and like I used to not follow anything and just search what I wanted. I just go on the search bar and type in MLB trade rumors or whatever it may be. And now I'm starting to follow people. So I'm actually getting that stuff coming through. And it's pretty cool. I had a Twitter years ago. It got hacked. So I just like, I'm never going to get those followers and following back. So I gave up and I, I'm going to get back into it. All right. So if we'll, 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 when we're ready for that one, you will, you will give it to that. If you're not ready. Maybe, yet. maybe season six. Not, not yet. <laughs> maybe during Rebels. Yeah. So we'll put that out there. So it's incentive for you to keep sticking with this podcast. Eventually you will find out his Twitter handle. That's right. All right. Thanks again, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike.